Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is David Brownell, and I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Jamestown Spalum Tribe. Uh, this is the third in my presentation series that I'm giving this year. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the archaeology of Squim Prairie, and realistically it should be more uh, archaeology and ethnography of Squim Prairie. So I'm going to share my screen with everybody and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, an archeological history of the Squim Prairie. Uh, in all honesty, it, it, the title should also be Squim Prairie. So it's sort of a misnomer to say Squim Prairie because that implies that there was just one. Um, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is the fact that uh, there were quite a few Squim Prairies and those different prairies had different uh, ethnographic and uh, you could even say agricultural uses for the Squalum people. Um, so this is a map showing you uh, where those prairies were based on the 1850s GLO maps. So uh, back in the 1850s the government, uh, the General Land Office had surveyors go out and survey uh, lands across the Pacific Northwest and uh, one thing to know on these maps is that they were extremely conservative in what they mapped as a prairie. So what you're looking at in terms of the, the red blobs or the red polygons on the map, those were the open areas where there was uh, only prairie vegetation. So no trees, uh, shrubs, that sort of thing. Uh, realistically, the Squim was an open landscape. So even outside of those polygons, um, you didn't have a densely forested landscape like in the west, rest of western Washington. Um, you would have had uh, groves of Gary Oak trees, you would have had stands of, of cottonwoods and alders and riparian areas. Um, but when you look at historic descriptions, uh, the reason why it's called the Squim Prairie today was because uh, back in the day if you traveled from say Washington Harbor over to Morse Creek, uh, it, it was described in the historic period as sort of a, a two or three mile wide swath of relatively open uh, grassland landscape that did have these specific prairies uh, where there was no vegetation or uh, no trees growing, but, but really there was a, a much broader open landscape. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looked like historically and then what happened um, to cause changes to the landscape and, and where those prairies went. Uh, so some of the archaeological sites that I'm going to be talking about today include the Manus Mastodon site. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty famous site for those of you who uh, don't, haven't heard about it. It's a few miles south of Squim. It was a Mastodon kill site dated to roughly a uh, little under 14,000 years before present. Um, and it's a uh, Mastodon skeleton and it has a bone point lodged in the ribs. And there were other characteristics, like for example, the skull was uh, twisted around 180 degrees and the skull cavity was, was broken open to harvest the brain matter. Um, some potential stone tools found. And then in sequential layers on, on top of the Manus Mastodon, they found additional evidence of uh, other species that used to be in this area like bison and caribou, caribou which we'll talk about later. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two sites associated with the Squim Bypass Project. So back about 20 years ago when they were putting Highway 101 through Squim, uh, as they were uh, surveying the right-of-way for the future highway, they found uh, two very significant archaeological sites, the larger of which is uh, right around the, the Squim Avenue Highway 101 interchange. And so we're going to talk about those today. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the Chiquing Village site uh, located at Washington Harbor, where uh, Battelle Marine Sciences Labs is today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Olcott archaeological traditions. And, and the term Olcott is used uh, by archaeologists referring back uh, pretty, far, <laughs> pretty far back uh, from at least 4,000 years before present to um, you know, pushing uh, pretty far back, 13, 14,000 years ago, uh, the, the Native Americans on the landscape who uh, were using these pebble tool traditions were hunting terrestrial mammals like the mastodon, like the caribou, elk, deer, 
Um, it's important to note at that time that long ago, uh, sea levels were a lot different than they were now and actually a lot lower. So uh, in terms of what we know today about how people um, are very uh, coastal oriented and tend to live in coastal situations um, and, and harvest a lot of resources in coastal areas in the inner tidal, that is now hundreds of feet underwater. So a lot of that evidence that we would have of those cultural traditions from that long ago um, are now under the Strait of Juan de Fuca in the Pacific Ocean. However, uh, because these folks were hunting terrestrial mammals, we find a lot of their campsites located on terraces overlooking um, rivers and especially river confluences. Um, and it's also important to note that 13,000 years ago to roughly 4,000 years ago, the landscape was a lot more open than it is today. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but um, the climate has changed in the last 14,000 years significantly. Uh, along with that, vegetation has changed, and so humans have had to adapt to those changes as well. So to talk a little bit more about the Manus Mastodon site, uh, one of the great things about the Manus Mastodon site is in addition to finding the Manus Mastodon and getting all of that archaeological data, they were able to get uh, pollen samples from this site going back over 12,000 years. So uh, we're able to get a really good idea of what was growing um, in and around Squim literally right at, after the end of the last ice age. Uh, and what the landscape looked like was much, much different than it is today. Uh, we had uh, small ponds and, and there were chunks of ice left over from the glaciers that were melting on the landscape. Um, these small wetlands. You also had, uh, it, it was much drier at that time, so you didn't have um, widespread forest. You would have had a, a small number of pines or spruces on the landscape. And then uh, the, the predominant vegetation would have been shrubs and grasses. Uh, and you would have had these large terrestrial mammals roaming across that landscape with small uh, small groups of people following them around and hunting them. Uh, when we look at the, the pollen and seeds from the Manus Mastodon site, uh, it looks like plants first occupied the deglaciated terrain uh, from roughly 12,000 to 11,000 years before present, um, and then you had a, a stage of succession of plants after that. And what they did was, uh, the way that they got this data was they uh, basically took a sediment column from two meters west of where they found the Mastodon and then they take slices out of that column and they analyze each one of those slices for the tiny grains of pollen that are in them. And they found some really interesting stuff. Some of the species that they found <laughs> that were uh, just beginning to occupy the Squim Prairie uh, back 13,800 years ago, some of those plant species are still here. Some of them are not, but many of them have long culinary medicinal uh, traditional uses with Native American tribes. Uh, some of the ones that are still in this area, like uh, Swassum, Shepardia canadensis, or Soapberry, uh, is important uh, medicinally and culturally for the tribes. The berries are still used to this day to make uh, Indian ice cream, which is a traditional favorite of tribal elders. Um, they found pollens of Opuntia fragilis, uh, our local native prickly pear squim cactus. Um, so a good example of a plant that was found here 12,000 years ago, but is not today, uh, uh, Ephedra viridis, aka Indian tea, which now the closest you can find it is actually the Columbian Basin or Nevada, so a couple hundred miles away, um, was originally located here uh, and was probably used by the, the tribes at that time. So around 6,000 years ago, uh, we had a climate shift where the climate went from um, much drier and the landscape looking from something similar to eastern Washington today. The climate got cooler, it got wetter, and uh, the forest began to close in in western Washington. And we began to see uh, species like the western red cedar really start spreading. Um, and then in conjunction with that, you see uh, human adaptations to the closing in of those forests and an increase in woodworking technologies. Um, this is when we see the use of western red cedar um, for the building of homes, uh, carving of canoes, uh, all of those traditions really take off in the archaeological record around this time 6,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things to note is that here in Squim we are in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains. So we naturally get less than 20 inches of rain per year. 
Uh, so this would have been a, a natural buffer against the closing of the forest. Uh, the Sklalem people still used fire traditionally to manage prairies and to keep that open landscape. Uh, but because we're in the rain shadow, uh, a, it required a much less intensive use of fire, say out on the, the west end of the Olympic Peninsula um, or in some of the wetter areas where it's a little bit harder to keep an opening in the forest and keep camas growing. Um, and then we also here in, in the, our corner of the Olympic Peninsula used to get hammered pretty hard by catastrophic wildfires. Um, usually between one, every one to 200 years, uh, there would be really significant wildfires, uh, usually set by lightning or some other natural factor, that would sweep across the landscape. And here in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains, uh, if, if that fire came during our dry season, uh, it could be very catastrophic. Um, but also uh, beneficial to the forest and to the Skolan people in, in ways that I'll discuss in more detail. Um, so we'll, we'll jump to the Squim Bypass site uh, and, and specifically talking about the site that's where, uh, around where Squim Avenue and Highway 101 interchange is today. There, there are actually two components to this site. The older component was, was located on a terrace um, that was uh, formerly overlooking the Bell Creek Channel, which uh, at the time that uh, this component was occupied was actually the, the Paleo Channel of the Dungeness River. So um, if you held your right hand out in front of your face, and you can kind of think of that as sort of the successive paths of the Dungeness River over, say, the last uh, 8,000 years, uh, your pinky finger all the way on the right side on the right side of your right hand if you're holding that out in front of your face that's the bell creek channel and that's the oldest paleo channel of the uh, dungeness river your next finger is the uh, gearing creek channel after that you've got the castellary creek channel your index finger is going to be the meadowbrook creek channel and if you can keep your thumb poking straight up that would be the current dungeness river channel today so basically over the last 10,000 years, the Dungeness River has shifted its alignment at least five times, leaving behind these remnant creek channels. The Bell Creek Channel is the oldest of those uh, Dungeness River paleo channels that we have data on. Um, and essentially what people were doing was uh, they occupied a small hunting camp on this terrace overlooking the Dungeness River paleo channel. And on the other side of that Dungeness River paleo channel was the Squim Prairie. Um, so sort of the uh, perfect hunting campsite. Um, then we see with the second component, a later component that was occupied from roughly 3,000 years before present, um, the most recent radiocarbon date that they got was roughly uh, 170 years before present. So uh, almost exactly matching up with uh, the arrival of um, sort of Western agriculture and, and landscape management techniques and the cessation of using of uh, burning of prairies and those traditional management techniques. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this more in, in a few slides, but it's important to note this, this archaeological site was located right on the southern periphery of the, the largest squim prairie. Um, the largest squim prairie, which was sort of where the town of squim sits today, uh, was a prairie because it's extremely well-drained gravelly soils that do not hold water uh, very well, especially during our dry months. So uh, from a biological or ecological perspective, um, very unproductive soils, very hard for most plants to survive, especially tree species. Um, however, there are certain prairie plant species that are well adapted to our rain shadow prairies that can thrive on that in that landscape. But this was a hunting camp overlooking a prairie that was used predominantly for hunting purposes. Um, the, the large squim prairie, which was roughly 300 acres, was not a productive camas prairie, which I'll talk about later, um, for those exact reasons, because those soils were so poorly drained. So we'll look at um, sort of the, the pollen uh, records from these sites, and, and you won't see camas in them, and that's why. These are, these are hunting camps, and that's what we see archaeologically. We've got uh, house pits that were occupied seasonally, probably from roughly uh, this time of year through mid to late fall when folks would travel back to the coastal winter villages. Uh, we've got house pits, and then within those house pits, we have uh, both uh, 
fire pits or hearths, and then we also have rock ovens. Uh, we have tool production centers used to make tools like uh, quartz microblades, flake stone tools, ground bone and wood tools, and then uh, ground slate points amongst others. And uh, what we see in the, uh, the faunal record, the, the animal bones we find there, uh, is that this was primarily used for the intensive hunting of elk and deer on the Squim Prairie. Um, that said, they were also opportunistically hunting snowshoe hare, uh, cougar remains were found, um, they also found some fish remains, flounder, oh my computer is about to restart, this is the second time this has happened and I cannot believe it. Um, I'm sorry folks, I will be right back as soon as I restart. Uh, so, talking about the, the Squim Bypass archaeological site, um, I think I was talking about how well, the archaeological evidence that we find at this site is primarily um, a lot of evidence of elk and deer hunting, butchering, and processing. Um, and when we say processing, um, it's important to note that uh, elk and deer were very significant for the Squalan people, not just for their meat, but also for their uh, hides and bone and antler, which were used to make tools. Um, elk hide was uh, fashioned into a sort of uh, armor that men would wear um, actually when they would go into battle. So they would have multiple layers of uh, thick elk hide armor on. Um, and then the uh, sinews, the sinews and ligaments of elk itself would have been um, cut off using those quartz microblades. And that was sort of used as your um, threads to haft, um, points to arrows, uh, dart blades, harpoons, that sort of thing. Um, and then elk antler was, and deer antler was incredibly important uh, for tool use. So elk antler tines, especially uh, because of their size, using uh, fire and some sharp, very sharp stones, you would hack those tines off and then you would use a sandstone abrader to grind those antler tines into a wedge. And elk antler wedges are what were used for working uh, western red cedar into planks for longhouses, um, for carving out logs into canoes, uh, just about anything you name it. Uh, western red cedar is extremely important uh, for many cultural reasons, but from a, a woodworking or technological perspective, it's great because it splits straight down the grain. So you can use an elk antler wedge and a, a hand maul, which was a handheld stone tool, uh, to drive that wedge into the red cedar and, and split off these perfectly straight planks. Um, so again, you know, they would have used just about every single piece of the, the deer elk uh, after they killed it. <clears throat> uh, so this, the diagram on the left side of the screen is actually a diagram of one of those pit houses. So you can see it's, it's roughly square in shape. Uh, if you look in sort of the the lower center of that square shape, you'll see a circle. That's the, the hearth, the fire pit, um, and it was actually beautifully constructed with these, uh, these stones that were perfectly fitted together, almost in a jigsaw puzzle style. And then you can see around that hearth, different areas outlined with dotted lines. Those are the various areas uh, with different tool production techniques. Um, one area, they found a, a pile of uh, deer and elk metatarsals so, and, and metacarpals, so the forelimbs at the very bottom of the legs of the elk and deer, and that's what they were processing to get those sinews um, using those tiny quartz microblades. And so what happens is over time, as you're processing those, you leave behind a pile of these um, metatarsal bones. Um, the, the point on the very lower left corner of your screen <coughs> is a flake day site uh, point, probably an arrowhead, uh, some sort of projectile point. Daysite is a, a type of stone that was brought here from uh, Mount Garibaldi up in British Columbia uh, during the last, last ice age by the glaciers, uh, was deposited when the glaciers melted, and then uh, the Squalum folks would just go down to the river, down to the gravel bars. They knew how to identify the stone type. Their ancestors knew how to identify the stone type. You would gather up a couple what are called cores, basically the, the, the rock of that type, bring those back to your campsite, and then flake those out into uh, stone tools. So, um, you know, we say projectile point slash knife, uh, without it being hafted, there's really, um, 
very limited ways of knowing exactly what it was used for, uh, but we do have some of these hafted in our tribal collections um, using the elk hide and sinews um, that were used as fishing knives. So, you know, most people when they would see the, the point down here on the lower left side of your screen, they would uh, typically think, oh, that's an arrowhead. Um, but these were also hafted onto uh, U handles using the elk sinews and used as fishing knives um, and, and utilitarian knives, that sort of thing. Uh, they also did pollen analysis at the Squim Bypass site, uh, which is great because it gives us an idea of what was growing on that, that larger Squim Prairie. Uh, and what we see is uh, Douglas fir, Gary oak, western red maple, big leaf maples, the, the, the native trees that are still in the area. Uh, a lot of the forbs that you would associate with the drier prairie, so yarrow, uh, bed straw, some of these other plants. Uh, what you don't see, they, they did find, they didn't find any camas pollen. Uh, they did find, uh, I think, at least one, possibly two uh, camas bulbs within one of the uh, house pits. Um, but it seems like the, the majority of the uh, plant usage at this site was centered around uh, burning Douglas fir and other tree species for firewood. And then um, in terms of uh, what they're eating was primarily uh, berries, which would have been available in the riparian corridors, like along the Bell Creek Channel right next to this campsite. Um, and that's sort of what this graphic is showing you. Um, the edible tissue, uh, so botanical flotation, what they do is they take... Uh, sediments that were excavated from the site and you actually float them in water uh, so certain um, the heavier sediments will sink the botanical the lighter botanical fragments will float you can go through those and you can identify um, for example at, at this site 74 percent of what they found was douglas fir charcoal and bark so again that's that's primarily from campfires um, some hardwood, and then just a little bit of edible tissue, uh, primarily hazelnut, elderberry, and then some of our other native uh, blackberries, raspberries, um, and one or two camas bulbs, and then some other seeds and rootlets. So not, not a lot of evidence of intensive um, camas harvesting or really much prairie plant harvesting or processing at this location. Uh, again, going back to this being primarily a, a hunting camp. Um, however, they, they did find that one camas bulb, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the importance of camas to the Coast Salish and the Squalum people. So back in the day, uh, camas was the second most highly traded foodstuff for the, the Squalum people next to salmon. Uh, we, the way it would work back in the day is women would traditionally return to a patch, you, best term to use would be a camas garden, uh, year after year to manage that patch, harvest the larger camas bulbs, returning the smaller camas bulbs to the soil to grow, weeding out things like death, death camas, which is a related species um, that has a white flower instead of a blue flower, uh, but during the dry season, it's, it's almost impossible to tell them apart. Uh, so you would go through during uh, spring, early summer, when camas is blooming, uh, weed out any of that death camas, any other undesirable species, leaving behind these patches of camas. Um, camas survives by sort of growing in a, in a bunch, and so uh, it's it's sort of augmenting the, the natural uh, growth techniques that camas uses. They, the women would cut a, a square turf using ironwood digging sticks flip that turf over, remove the larger bulbs, and then flip the turf back over, leaving the smaller bulbs to continue growing. Um, and so uh, Mary Hunter, uh, Hall Hunter Wood, a uh, tribal ancestor uh, from the Hall family, she uh, gave us a description to Erna Gunther, an ethnographer who worked for the University of Washington, uh, for a very long time and worked with Squalum elders back in the 1920s. Uh, she talked a little bit about how camas used to be found um, all over in the prairies long ago. Uh, women would spend an entire day out digging camas to return with uh, just a little basket for a day's work. Uh, the reason why they would uh, exert all of this effort for camas, it's uh, an extremely important uh, starch and carbohydrate rich bulb that you can slow cook in a pit 
um, and essentially preserve for winter months when there's not many starchy or carbohydrate rich foods available. Um, one of the one of the most important um, cultural traditions of, of the Coast Salish and Pacific Northwest tribes in general were uh, food preservation techniques that allowed tribes to preserve the, the bounty of spring, summer, fall resources uh, here in the Pacific Northwest and preserve those for the leaner winter months. And uh, camas was a, was a crucial part of that. Um, has, has a slightly sweet taste um, and could be mixed with a, a variety of different other foods uh, for traditional meals. Um, camas would have been cooked in uh, those pit ovens like we were talking about with the Squim Bypass site. Uh, essentially you would excavate a hole in the ground, uh, put rocks in it, build a fire on top of those rocks, uh, brush the embers of the fire off, put your food stuff on top of those rocks while they're red hot, cover them up with another vegetative material like fern fronds, salal leaves, um, even cedar boughs, something like that. Uh, essentially let it steam for a couple of hours, depending on the amount of camas you were cooking um, and, and the, the way that you were trying to cook it. Um, some camas cooking techniques can even take, you know, uh, several hours to overnight uh, and then uncover it and you have your uh, cooked camas. The uh, clams are cooked actually in a very similar fashion in, in pit ovens. Uh, the image on the left side of your screen are camas bulbs that were excavated from a camas oven over on Whidbey Island uh, at Eby's Landing, so sort of directly across Admiral, Admiral to, Admiralty Inlet from Port Townsend. Um, so I, I talked about sort of the, the fact that there were different types of squim different prairies, different types of prairies, um, and I wanted to bring this image back up from earlier. So if you look at the map on the left side of your screen, um, the, the sort of uh, pastel yellow blobs that you can see, those are the, the, what the GLO mapped as prairie. So you can see the squim prairie, the large roughly 300 acre squim prairie, um, sort of in the lower right quadrant of that map. Um, and you can see that there's actually green uh, inclusions out in the middle of the prairie. Those would have been uh, Gary Oak groves. And those were actually incredibly important for the Sklalem people uh, for the harvesting of acorns. Uh, and a, a lot of times the understory under those Gary Oaks were beaked hazelnuts, another very important uh, food stuff. So uh, that, that primary squim prairie, 300 acre prairie there, and the sporcine prairie, which is uh, located almost due south of that at the foot of uh, west side of Burnt Hill, uh, those are on those extremely uh, uh, well-drained gravelly soils, um, very dry prairies not retaining moisture from roughly July through September. Uh, those would have been used primarily as um, hunting zones, uh, hunting areas. The prairies that you see over uh, towards the upper left quadrant of the map, so more the prairies that were more oriented along the shore, those are on, you can see that those are on different soils. Uh, much better soils that retain moisture much longer out of the year. Actually, one of those prairies today is mapped by Clallam County as a wetland. Those would have been the Camas Gardens, the Camas Prairies, um, and, those, and it makes sense. Those prairies are also in close uh, association with associ association with Squalum Village sites right at the mouth of the Dungeness River, um, especially Long Prairie that you can see just south of Dungeness there. Uh, that's, that's the primary prairie where women harvested um, not just camas, uh, the other very important food resource on those prairies was fern roots. Uh, women would go out, gather fern roots, and uh, the fern roots themselves are processed to create uh, almost a sort of flower. Fern roots are, are another uh, great source of starches. Uh, however, I would caution before anybody goes out there and starts digging up fern roots and trying to cook them if you do it incorrectly. Um, it can be very detrimental to your health. So I probably should have said that at the beginning of this presentation, but please do not go out and start eating any of these plants um, without consulting a cultural expert. There are um, techniques, traditional techniques of cooking these foods so that they are beneficial to your health and not harmful, uh, but without lots of experience and that knowledge, um, it can be very dangerous. So the map on the right side of your screen is showing you um, another set of soils maps. So you can see the, the QOA, uh, 
that's our uh, our Holocene uh, sediments that are essentially gravels that were deposited by the glaciers as they moved north at the end of the last ice age. Um, just dunch, uh, ditched a bunch of uh, rock on us, what we like to call squim potatoes for the for the locals on the on the presentation. Um, I live on the south side of Squim, and if I go out and dig in my yard, as soon as I get under the two inches of sod or turf, it's just solid rock all of the way down. Uh, it doesn't hold moisture, therefore trees don't grow on it very well. If you do a moderate burn cycle of every, say, three to five years, you're gonna keep trees from encroaching on that prairie and keep an open landscape, keep an open line of sight. It's much easier to hunt elk and deer on that landscape. Similarly, with the smaller uh, Camas prairies, Wemwin would burn those every two to three years, um, not only to burn back encroaching uh, firs and other shrubs and small trees, uh, but it also returns a lot of those nutrients to the soil and it encourages a better regrowth of um, the plants that you want to harvest the next year. Um, so some of the other, the other important prairies plant species that we're harvesting out here. Uh, we had a species of wild carrot. It, it is still found um, sort of hanging on and in some little nooks and crannies around Squim. But again, I would strongly, strongly uh, urge caution on anybody going out and trying to gather wild carrot, Pacific hemlock parsley um, in the wild because it is extremely similar to poison hemlock. Um, and poison hemlock is very aptly named. Uh, that's what killed Socrates. You don't want to mess with this stuff. You really don't even want to uh, have it on your on your bare skin or get exposed to it in that way. So, um, again, great to look at, but please don't go out and try gathering wild carrots because there's a good chance you'll you'll actually be digging poison hemlock. Um, another very very important uh, plant for culinary and medicinal uses was kexmin or a bare stem biscuit root. Uh, this plant, uh, it's called biscuit root for an obvious reason and, and was incredibly important, not just to the Squalum and Coast Salish, but also tribes on the Eastern uh, side of the Cascade Mountains. There's, there's a lot of different types of lomatium, different types of biscuit root uh, that grow throughout the West, uh, but they all have a very deep, large tap root that uh, again has lots of starches, carbohydrates, lots of nutrients, um, actually has a nice, uh, it's a relative of celery, so it has sort of a roasted celery taste to it. Um, and then the, the fresh greens off the plant would have actually been eaten as well, sort of in a salad. Um, and then the, the plant also had various medicinal uses for the, the Squalum people. And again, this is another plant that uh, we do have hanging on locally. Um, and some very unique um, ecological areas that uh, we're trying to preserve. And uh, this is sort of, the, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but some of the other important uh, prairie plant species that the Squalum would have been harvesting, um, Lomatium dissectum, another Lomatium species that the root would have been eaten and then had a, a additional medicinal uses, um, beaked hazelnuts, and Gary Oak acorns, I mentioned those earlier, a uh, great source of carbohydrates, uh, were eaten just plain and unprocessed, cracked right out of the shell. Uh, nodding onion um, is our one of our native uh, onion species, very, very strong flavor. So it was eaten, but you don't need much of it, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, chocolate lilies, the bulbs would have been harvested, um, as well as tiger lilies. Um, and harvest brodea. Again, these wild lilies and, and the harvest brodea, these would have been growing on those squim prairies um, in that same suite of, of uh, ecological plants and, and uh, benefited from those same uh, landscape management techniques by the Squalum people. Um, harvest brodea, the, the reason that the plant is named harvest named harvest brodeo was because when it was first recorded to science it was because <laughs> they were actively harvesting it the coast salish peoples were harvesting it at that time so what happened to the squim prairie uh, this photo is the oak grove that's right there at the squim avenue uh, highway 101 interchange um, and we're lucky enough to have a couple of these scary oak groves still hanging on 
around squim, uh, but what you can see there is the, the undergrowth under the Gary Oaks is almost entirely invasive uh, pasture grasses. There's a little bit of snowberry, um, maybe some nuca rose mixed in there too, uh, but the understory is now almost entirely dominated by non-native uh, invasive plant species. And the reason for that was uh, the Squim Dungeness area was actually one of the earliest areas that was uh, heavily modified for uh, Western agricultural purposes. So uh, starting as early as 18, uh, the 1850s, um, non-native uh, immigrants started arriving in the Squim Dungeness area. Uh, a lot of them came directly over from Victoria on Vancouver Island and settled in the Dungeness area. Um, and established farms. They established those uh, their farms on those prairies. And so uh, right off the bat, you have a source of conflict there in that um, you have non-natives arriving in this area, settling on prairies, uh, converting them to Western agricultural purposes without understanding that those prairies were actually under uh, agricultural and management uses by the Squalum people. Um, and you actually have in, in the historic record when you look at uh, what a lot of these early uh, uh, farmers were recording, they were talking about how there were uh, potato patches on these prairies. The Squalum uh, gained access to potatoes. They were brought, potatoes were brought up the west coast um, uh, by the Spanish. They established a small fort out on the Macaw Reservation at Nia Bay for a few years. Uh, after, long after the Spanish left, the quote-unquote Ozette potato was still there. Um, those potatoes were then traded throughout the, the Salish Sea um, to different tribes. The, uh, the techniques that you use to manage and grow a potato patch is actually very, very similar to what the women were already doing with camas. Um, and so what you see is a proliferation of potato patches in those prairies where women were already managing camas gardens. Uh, Non-native uh, immigrants arrive, see these nice potato patches on prairies, build their log cabin right there, and then a couple months later when the tribes return to do their seasonal harvest, you have a source of conflict because the tribes are going out there and harvesting um, what the, the non-natives see as their farm, um, when in reality that, that landscape has been managed for thousands of years by the tribes. Um, and what you see here in the, uh, the pattern that was established as they, uh, as they established these farms is the farms were essentially uh, around the periphery of the prairies, uh, especially the Squim Prairie, because again, the prairie was so well drained um, that out in the middle of the prairie, nothing's going to grow for four months out of the year, the, the most productive times of the year. Um, and so again, this gets into the early hydro modifications that happened around Squim. Um, and by the 1890s, they were digging irrigation ditches to irrigate those prairies to make them, quote, more productive to convert them to um, intensive Western agricultural, um, industrial agricultural purposes compared to the less intensive uh, landscape management techniques used by the Squalum. Um, also to note on the map on the right side, you can see the little dotted lines connecting those prairies um, that the GLO office recorded in 1855 as roads. Those weren't roads in 1855. Th those were the Indian trails, the hunting trails, that connected these prairies from one to the other. And then those trails actually continued from those prairies south up into the mountains um, to other re resource gathering locations at prairies up in the, the subalpine and alpine zones. Uh, so what would happen, uh, basically you had a seasonal cycle here as, as the squim prairies dried out roughly around um, late June to mid-July, uh, women would move to sequentially higher and higher elevations to where um, those prairie plants were, were then in uh, better production up in the alpine, subalpine zones. Um, many of these prairie plant species that I'm talking about today, you can also go up and see those at, say, Hurricane Ridge, but they're in bloom. Uh, three months later. So uh, at the time that, say, late July, uh, most of the plants on the Squim Prairie were dead and brown and dry, uh, you could go up to the subalpine and alpine prairie and harvest those important medicinal and culinary plants up there. And we see that archaeologically, um, 
that there's also a, a massive number of archaeological sites up in that alpine and subalpine zone that are again centered around um, the men would be out hunting uh, deer and elk and the women would be gathering um, medicinal and food plants. Uh, and then this image sort of captures all of the, the hydro modifications that had already occurred by 1914. So, um, you know, it's, it's important to know when a lot of people say, well, there's, there's very little to no information about squim, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, about camas growing around squim. It's important to note that by 1914, most of those prairies had already been extremely modified um, either by uh, the introduction of irrigation ditches, new wells, um, uh, levees along the, the river and some of the creek systems and other uh, various man-made factors. Um, another factor that, that used to be um, hugely influential on our landscape that I mentioned earlier that sort of stopped over the last 150 years is wildfires themselves. So um, the image in the bottom left side of your screen is showing you a lens of charcoal and oxidized sediments. Uh, almost anywhere that you dig and squim. And I can say uh, after five years of working out here, I've, I've stared in a lot of holes in the ground. Just about anywhere that you dig and squim, you will find evidence of wildfires. Um, they were simply that prevalent, um, and it was just part of the natural cycle of life here on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, since the uh, uh, since the cessation of, of native landscape management techniques and the, the intensive uh, intentional use of fire to manage the landscape, uh, those wildfires have ceased. And so um, in addition to losing ground to invasive species, um, especially introduced pasture grasses on the, on the squim prairies that were used uh, for grazing cattle, horses, sheep, um, other introduced species, uh, another major factor that we're battling now is uh, essentially these, these prairies are being closed out by encroaching Douglas fir forests. Um, now that we've gone roughly a, a, a century, a century and a half without these burns being used to push back those, those encroaching Douglas firs, these prairies are disappearing at a rapid rate. And, and in another hundred years, uh, you'd be hard pressed to, to find a lot of the ones that are especially up in the national forest lands, national park lands. Um, the, the federal government um, in the past has adopted a very um, uh, anti-fire stance in terms of managing uh, the landscape, uh, primarily because their interest is centered around uh, timber harvest and, and economically uh, viable uh, timber. Uh, which is great, but it also means that no fire is used ever, and so um, some of those prairies up in, in the higher elevations are, are disappearing very rapidly. Um, so the tribe, the, the Jamestown tribe, is actively working on um, some prairie restoration projects. These photos are from a roughly two, two and a half acre parcel just east of the Dungeness River Audubon Center. Um, if you're familiar with the Audubon Center and the, the Olympic Discovery Trail, um, this is the field just on the south side of the Olympic Discovery Trail as you're headed east towards Squim and away from the River Center. Um, the tribe acquired this property a few years ago, um, and as you can see by these images, uh, this, this was pasture, horse pasture, for a very, very long time. So we have our work cut out for us. Uh, but what you can see in these images, it's very hard to see in the image on the left, but there's uh, a patch of our native uh, blue wild rye grass growing there. Um, in the top middle image, you see the, the pink flower is uh, Farewell to Spring, one of our native uh, uh, prairie wildflowers. And then the image on the right you can see is our um, blue lupine, our native blue lupine. And then you can actually see in the top left corner that is some alfalfa growing right next to it. So perfect example of, um, you know, we our, our uh, traditional, the Jamestown Tribe Traditional Foods and Cultural Program went out and actually bladed this uh, twice to sort of uh, disturb as much of those pasture grasses and, and grind up as much of their roots as possible. And then they hammered this area with a ton of native prairie plant species 
So what happened the next year was some of those prairie plant species popped up, but then you can also see this very dense thatch of pasture grasses. So ecologically, our native prairie plant species grow in a very different way than introduced species. Introduced pasture grasses grow, um, they essentially, they, they, they cover the ground with a mat of vegetative growth, um, mainly grass species, and then these will essentially build up a thatch layer um, and then uh, reseed themselves in that thatch layer over time. Our native prairie plant species grow as uh, bunch plants. So, uh, for example, our, our Romer's fescue or even the, the blue wild rye, they grow as a bunch grass. And then you would have um, the farewell to, spring, farewell to spring wildflowers would grow in a bunch. And so the, the squim prairie uh, was essentially a bunch of bunches of vegetation with, with patches of bare soil in between. And the best comparison that I can give today um, for folks in the Squim area is if you're on Highway 101 um, driving past Squim, if you look at the swales on the side of the highway, especially um, just before you get to the Dungeness River Bridge on the right side of the highway, just at the, uh, on each side of the River Road exit, the swales that come down to the highway, if you look at those today, what you'll see are bunches of Romer's fescue bunch grass with patches of bare soil in between. That's very much reminiscent of what the Squim Prairie would have looked like. Um, you know, prairies were not these dense grasslands that looked like a, a manicured lawn or even um, a, a cattle pasture, like what some people might think of. Um, they were patchy, and that patchiness allowed these native species to spread, um, to maintain themselves in, in uh, biologically sustainable populations. Uh, these invasive pasture grasses come in, uh, they lay down a ton of seed, they establish rhizomial mats that choke out any other life. So um, it's, it's sort of an issue of, of incompatibility. Um, the other major factor involved is the introduction of irrigation and the use of irrigation. Um, the non-native pasture grasses are, are uh, dependent on irrigation um, to thrive. Our non-native prairie plant species uh, thrive in non-irrigated areas. So the, the areas where we still find our native prairie plant species clinging on are sort of in these peripheral marginal environments, very dry, non-irrigated areas, um, not because that's their favorite place to live, but because they have evolved over millions of years to survive in our dry climate in areas that aren't irrigated. Um, if we stopped irrigating the rest of Squim, a lot of those non-native species would slowly die back and our, our native uh, prairie plant species would be um, in a much better situation in terms of their long-term survival. Um, and then uh, another, another big thing uh, from my personal perspective is, is actually um, individuals doing their own personal prairie restoration projects. These photos are from uh, a small project my wife and I are doing on our farm. Um, where we're just slowly uh, basically doing an area of about 200 square feet every year, um, getting rid of the invasive uh, vegetation and then uh, reintroducing native prairie plant species. So you can see in this image we've got um, Farewell to Spring, Nodding Onion, Romer's Fescue. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this photo, but there's also a lot of yarrow. Um, we have some blue camas and then some Lomatium nudicale growing in. And uh, that's where I really see the potential um, for uh, the future of uh, the prairies around Squim is, is when individuals start really getting involved in, in uh, reestablishing these, these species on their own properties. Um, and it's very beneficial. I don't, I don't have to water any of these species from summer through fall. And these photos were actually taken in late July. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a misnomer to think that everything's going to be totally dead if you plant native species. Um, Farewell to Spring is aptly named. You get this beautiful bloom of these um, pink and dark pink, uh, almost poppy-like flowers in, in uh, mid to late July. Uh, our native prairie plant species, they're much better for your lawn than introduced pasture grasses. Um, they don't need nitrogen. They don't need other introduced fertilizers. They don't need 
uh, irrigation through the dry season, uh, and our uh, native pollinators love them. Uh, so I will go ahead and, uh, so next month I'm going to be talking about uh, Shaquing Squim, uh, Squalum Village at Washington Harbor, which I mentioned during this presentation. Um, we, uh, the Jamestown tribe curates the archaeological collections from this site. We also work closely with uh, Battelle uh, Marine uh, Sciences Laboratory that currently uh, is at the site and Department of Energy that works at the site on um, managing that site and then also uh, we've also started uh, returning to some of those traditional uh, plant gathering practices um, around this village site which is something else that I'll, I'll be happy to talk about in more detail. So I'll go ahead and quit sharing my screen there and we will um, I'll jump to questions in the chat. <laughs> Goodbye everybody we'll see you next month.